Look at this map I found. Now we've all heard of a legend of Atlantis. This is a map that shows the mythical land of Atlantis. Whether Atlanteans or giants. And it matches all the characteristics of Atlantis. Atlantis is waiting. I can't believe it. And this map asserts that it's maybe not so mythical. It shows exactly where it is. I mean, everything else about this map, if you just look at like the lines of the current day world, is accurate. It's a well-made map. It was made at the end of the 1800s. And yet it shows Atlantis and a bunch of other crazy stuff, saying that it existed about a million years ago. I bought the originals. And if I look giddy, it's because I am. I love old original maps. And it's not just one map, it's four of them. <laughs> These maps claim to explain some of the greatest mysteries of human civilization. How ancient civilizations, despite not being able to communicate with each other, invented similar looking structures an ocean away. It's a story about the birth of civilization, the spread of technology. I wanna tell you the story of these maps, these maps that assert that Atlantis is real and that we can learn something from it. I also think we can learn something from these maps. These are effectively treasure maps, purporting to show you the location of Atlantis. They're part of this book that argues that Atlantis is real, a detailed history and explanation. So let me tell you the story of these maps, which is the story of Atlantis. So it all starts with Plato. Plato was one guy living in Athens 2,400 years ago. He had some really good ideas. Ideas about justice, education, government, science, and a bunch of other things that influenced how our Western society developed. Pretty influential, incredible guy. And here he is in one of his texts describing a land called Atlantis. He said it was a utopia that was located, quote, past the pillars of Hercules. So somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. According to Plato, the city was built as a series of circles with a complex system of canals and walls made out of exotic metals. It was full of advanced technology and engineering. There was a massive palace. The city was decorated with golden statues. Plato says that Atlantis had an advanced military and navy which ruled over this huge island civilization. Okay, before we go on here, let me make one thing crystal clear, which is that most historians agree that Plato wasn't describing a literal place. In his mind, Atlantis was a parable. It was a lesson that he was using to talk about utopian societies and the hubris of man and the downfall of humans and all of these things, and that it wasn't actually real. But the idea of this advanced civilization in the middle of the Atlantic did not go away. It stuck around for centuries, especially when Europeans started exploring the world. It's like the 1500s, Europeans are out discovering new lands, and a lot of these explorers were secretly hoping that they would stumble upon some advanced lost civilization like Plato's Atlantis, where maybe they would find all these precious resources and advanced technology. But the idea of Atlantis didn't really take off in any sort of serious way until a couple centuries later, with the arrival of science. 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 Science was not invented by Europeans in like the 1700s, but Europe was going through a scientific revolution where more and more people were tinkering with instruments and methodologies that were teaching them about reality. They were displacing the old explanation that God was responsible for all of reality, and they were gathering empirical evidence that explained the world in new ways. As a part of all of this science, European explorers were stumbling upon lost cities, cities they thought were just myths. If these thought to be mythical cities ended up being real and scientists are finding them, what else was out there? Maybe Plato's Atlantis? So yeah, it's the 1800s, science is having a big moment and Atlantis is trending once again. There was no concept in the mid 1800s that civilization had been around for thousands and thousands of years. You know, most people were still kind of using the Bible as the main source of information about the human past. So people thought that the earth was relatively young. People were approaching the idea of Atlantis with a much more scientific lens. There was a bunch of scientific theories on offer at the time. For example, we were learning just how much the continents we stand on aren't fixed. They're actually all floating around, bumping into each other. And this helped explain why scientists were finding fossils that matched up with each other, even though they were an ocean apart. They were seeing this same sort of thing with cultures as well. The Egyptians and the Mayans both had created pyramids, but there's no way they could talk to each other. Their arches, their writing systems, their agricultural practices, all very similar. 
How could you explain this? And this is where this idea caught hold. What if there was one civilization where all of this knowledge had stemmed from? One that was perhaps right in between the new and old world. What if it was Plato's Atlantis? People in Europe and America really started to think about Atlantis through the lens of science. They started producing books and lectures and studies and graphs and maps. And this gets us to the maps that I've been obsessed about. The maps that I pulled the trigger on and just bought the originals because I couldn't help myself. Can we just get a short montage that shows how beautiful these maps are, please? Thank you. Okay, so here's where the story gets a little bit wild. I'm gonna show you finally what these maps show. But this is also where things get a little bit dark. These maps were created by a Scottish banker turned amateur cartographer and anthropologist at the very end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s. You have to understand something about that time. Yes, a scientific revolution was taking place. Yes, science was trending and we were revolutionizing everything about how we saw the world. And yet at the same time, there was another revolution, which was a spiritual revolution. People were throwing off the old ways of thinking about God, but were still in this kind of awkward middle ground where they wanted to embrace science, but they also had some like leftover thinking from like the religious days, making claims about reality, but using kind of superficial empirical evidence and then filling in the blanks, connecting the dots with more evidence that they had gathered by being in touch with spirits or psychic powers. These clairvoyant powers boosted their ability to do science, which, you know, wasn't really science. We're talking about the, the late 19th century, and so we don't know that much. We don't have some of the same skills and the same tool set that we have today in archeology. span And this makes Atlantis the perfect target for this sort of thinking. And it's that kind of thinking that produced these maps. So let me decode them for you. Okay, real quick, I'm gonna pause the story because I need to thank today's sponsor. Thank you, Incogni, for sponsoring today's video. Longtime sponsor of our journalism. So there was a day when I used to get robocalls and spam emails all of the time. Like I was like drowning in this and it was annoying. And now it doesn't happen anymore. And that's in large part thanks to Incogni. What you do is you give Incogni permission to go out on your behalf to try to take you off the lists of data brokers that are buying and selling your data to try to market to you, to try to put you on people search lists, to try to sell to insurance companies that might jack up your premiums because they now know your web browsing history. Like it gets really predatory really fast. Little do most of us know we have rights to be taken off of these lists. It's a really cumbersome process to do that on your own. So Incogni has built a service that does this for you and they let you see the progress. You have this dashboard that allows you to see how many lists they've requested, how many are in progress and how many you've successfully been taken off of. And for me, I'm like in the hundreds, like hundreds of lists that I used to be on and now I'm not, which feels really freaking good. I use the monthly subscription, which means that Incogni is always scrubbing these lists and finding my name and my information and requesting that it be taken off. So Incogni sponsors this video. I'm really happy they do that. They give a big discount to my viewers. You get 60% off if you do the yearly plan, which means that Incogni will constantly be in the background scrubbing, try to find you on these lists, try to take you off these lists. Use the link, it's incognito.com slash Johnny Harris. There's also a code that you gotta use at checkout. It's just Johnny Harris, no spaces. Thank you Incogni for sponsoring today's video. And with that, let's keep talking about Atlantis because there's so much more to cover here. Okay, this first one, Atlantis at its prime. So you can see that you have a map of the modern day world. That's all this black back here. Okay, that's like the map today. But then the red shading over it is what the author, William Scott Elliott, says the world looked like all these years ago. So it looked kind of like this. The bluish green is another set of land that the author said existed a long time ago. But I'm gonna focus on the red here because that's where we get Atlantis. The reason there's four maps is because this author wanted to represent what the world looked like over time as the ocean rose and fell. Which remember, that's a real thing that happens in real life tectonic plates move around and the ocean rises and falls like the entire west coast of the united states used to be underwater that's like an undisputed fact william scott elliott is pulling from that real scientific theory to create his own theory of atlantis so if you look right here 
This is what William Scott Elliot says is the continent of Atlantis. It's labeled right there, Atlantis. The main population center is right here, the city of the Golden Gates. Oh, but it's not just maps. There's a whole book. Boy, this book. This book is wild. In this book, William Scott Elliot describes in detail the city of Atlantis. It follows a lot of what Plato described in terms of a circular city that was full of sophisticated canals and palaces and stuff. But boy, William Scott Elliot takes it to an entirely new level. I mean, let me show you. Welcome to William Scott Elliot's Atlantis. An ancient civilization that reached its prime a million years ago. Most of the details of this version of Atlantis were revealed not through real scientific inquiry, but through William Scott Elliot's brain, through spiritual clairvoyance, which he blended with a few scientific factoids at the time to build out this story. Atlantis is a circular city with this massive palace at the center. The engineering is highly sophisticated with a complicated canal system that manages the city water. And look, there's an underwater reservoir in the shape of a heart from which the city gets its drinking water. At its height, he says, two million people lived here and they were of a unique Atlantean race with unique powers and characteristics. They wielded advanced tech like these flying battleships that used a type of energy from a different plane, not measurable by our understanding of physics. An etheric plane, whatever that means. This understanding of different energy planes allowed the Atlantean race to wield nature in powerful ways, creating a kind of powerful sorcery that could be used for both good and evil. They wrote on sheets of metal, they drank blood hot from the animal, they had explosives that released poisonous gas, and the women were treated equally. Wow. Okay, before we get too drunk on all these juicy, tantalizing sci-fi details, let's just check in on like what's going on here. Is this guy writing a piece of fiction or is he trying to do science? Yes, he produced a set of painstakingly detailed maps that look like real maps. Like you, there is the world. I see the world in the shape of the world. And yet he's describing a civilization with supernatural powers. All of this happening a million years ago, which is about 990,000 years before scientists say that humans started farming, domesticating animals, and developing what would become civilization. Okay, but don't worry. William Scott Elliot has an explanation for this. Catastrophes. He says that there was a global catastrophe 800,000 years ago. It was an ice age that ripped through the earth and reshaped the entire planet, which is how you get from this to map number two. So here's the world starting 800,000 years ago after the big ice age. Atlantis is still here, but it's starting to kind of sink into the sea. Fast forward, that gets us to map number three and map number four, according to William Scott Elliot. It's these catastrophes that sunk Atlantis into the ocean until it became this smaller island, which is what he says Plato was referring to when he was talking about this utopian society. And then finally, the ocean rose and Atlantis sunk completely in the year 9,564 BC. Pretty specific there, William, which is the time that he says there was a massive flood that covered the whole planet. He says it's the same flood that happened in the Bible, Noah's Ark, remember? And that the flood sunk Atlantis once and for all into the ocean. Goodbye, Atlantis. Great civilization is now gone. But before it sunk, people from Atlantis had fled east and west across the world, bringing with them their knowledge about advanced technology, engineering, architecture. And this is his explanation for why the Egyptians and the Mayans had pyramids. Oh, and he also says that the descendants of these Atlanteans would go on to be the Aryan race, which would be the most advanced civilization. Yeah, we'll get back to that in just a sec because it gets pretty messed up. Anyway, so you get the story. There's so much more to this that like, I'm just gonna, I'll leave all my reading in the source document so you can see it because it gets nuts and there's so much more kind of racializing of this story. But what this is, is a pseudo-scientific attempt to tell a story that was based off of spiritual revelations, meaning not science, but it is clothed in sciencey looking things. That's what this is. Let's just be very clear. I'm not saying it's anything other than that. And at the time that was kind of accepted by some circles. My big question here is why? Why would this guy do this? Like, did he make a bunch of money off of like duping people into the legend of Atlantis? I don't think so. Why would he make all of this up? We'll never know exactly why, but my theory is that he really believed this stuff. I think 
like a lot of us, William Scott Elliot had constructed a worldview that helped explain the mysteries he didn't understand. And he used a variety of rational and spiritual means to construct a story that helped him make sense of the world. We all kind of do this. This guy just happened to do it in a map that 120 years later we can all look at and like gawk at, even though it's a really beautiful map and I'm totally gonna hang this on my wall. This was his explanation. Someone trying to explain how the native people in a new world who Europeans saw as primitive and inferior had somehow built such sophisticated structures. This story helped explain that. So the world those guys are talking about is a world in which mainly dark-skinned people are kind of backward and kind of primitive and a cadre of white folks who are members of this advanced civilization travel around the world and give them culture. And yes, it resulted in this implication that there was one superior Aryan race, an idea that unfortunately endured into the 1930s, when one man became obsessed with trying to use scientific sounding methods to prove the same thing. This is Heinrich Himmler. He's the architect of the Holocaust. And before World War II, he funded archeological expeditions in search of evidence that would prove the existence of a superior ancient civilization in an attempt to validate his horrible motives for trying to wipe out entire races. It's an effort that was loosely depicted in this Indiana Jones movie. One of the leaders of this Nazi archeological effort speculated that the ancestors of the German people were actually from Atlantis and that they had escaped when the continent sunk and came to Germany. It was the same thing that William Scott Elliot was doing, building a bogus story using an old parable, but in this case, to justify some of the most heinous acts of violence in our history. So the big question that I should just answer very clearly, is there any evidence that Atlantis existed? Well, it depends what you mean by evidence. If you're someone who looks at the many mysteries in our world and is comfortable filling in the blanks with your own guesses, especially the ones that feel good, then yes, there's a million different things that you could look at, connect the dots on, that would make you believe that Atlantis is real. But if you're somebody who believes in the long, slow process of scientific knowledge, where many different scientists gather, analyze, and debate evidence over decades, until they establish a consensus of what is true, if that's your definition of compelling evidence, then no. Atlantis, which was constructed by Plato as a parable to teach people, has no basis in empirical fact. It just simply does not. And yet my big lesson out of all of this is that even after centuries of like good science and archeological methodologies that tell us what's real and are still trying to discover the other mysteries, we still are so like, intoxicated by this story for the same reason these guys were. It's a really tempting idea. It's kind of a comforting idea. I think a lot of people want there to be something wonderful and fascinating and lost out there that they don't know about. As an archeologist, I often try to communicate to them that the human past is interesting enough without making a bunch of stuff up. But to me, this is just a good story clothed in scientific language and images, which is perhaps the most dangerous of them all because it looks real. It co-ops the language of science to tell lies. And it continues to live on in the form of History Channel documentaries, a recent Netflix documentary that indulge these same ideas because people like to believe. So to me, not only is this map beautiful, but it also serves as a cautionary tale. I want to hang this on my wall to remind me that even if it looks sciency, and has a lot of big scientific words that doesn't make it proof, that doesn't make it true. We've been scanning these maps and we've created a poster that you can buy. We will create 500 of them. There are four original maps I bought for this story. I'm keeping one of them, but three of them are up for grabs. The original map that was printed at the time. Nick, who has been doing all of this scanning, has some thoughts on why one would want to purchase a map like this for their home. Nick? Own a piece of Western esoteric history, an original 1900 William Scott Elliot Atlantis map. It really represents the like late 1800s and early 1900s fascination and obsession with mysticism and like the esoteric in general. So people 
became totally obsessed with things like Atlantis and seances and stuff. So it's a cool thing to be able to own a piece of like mystical history and like where science and mysticism really, really intersected. Maps are for sale. Go get them now in the description. Thank you all for being here, for uh, being on this journey as we continue to learn about the history of evidence and science and how we know what we know. It's an ongoing discussion and debate and boy, it's an important one to have these days. So thanks for being here and I'll see you in the next one. Paper, you can like see the fiber in the old paper. The original printing artifacts that are just like, you can't recreate this stuff with digital. I've tried, we've gotten pretty close, but like there's just nothing like it. Also some bold font choices here.